didn't see you there. My name is Patrick Eckert, and I'm going to explain to you the physics behind a bow. So you see here, we got a beautifully drawn recurve bow right here. It's normally you'd think, oh, the string would be like sitting right here at rest. But right now we have a beautifully drawn <coughs> bow where some imaginary outside force, maybe Mr. Sadler, has pulled the bow back. And because it's pulled back, it's got potential energy. Oh yeah. So, the potential energy can be seen as coming from the draw weight of the bow, or the amount of, which is the amount of force it takes to pull the string back, and the draw length, the, the amount of length you've pulled the, the bow string back. Now, the potential energy is stored in the tension of the bow string, where the draw weight is in the y-axis and the draw length is in the x-axis. This creates a linear relationship between the two, as you, can see, be see, as you can see by this beautifully drawn graph. Now, right here, you see we've shaded in the area under it. And you may be wondering, why would we do that? Well, it turns out the area under the graph is equal to the potential energy. Oh, yeah. The potential energy is where all the wonderful things of a bow comes from. Because without potential energy, how could you have kinetic? And the potential energy over here, you can see, is represented by the formula half the force times the displacement. And as you can see, the, the area of this triangle would be half the force times displacement, half base times height. So that makes sense. And as you can see, that is also equivalent to half kx squared, or Hooke's law, which is also a good formula for potential energy. Now, when the, bow is, when the bow string is released, it becomes kinetic energy, and that kinetic energy is what does all the damage, it's what gets that, it, it's what gets that arrow into the target. So that's how a bow works. Hello, my name, is, my name is Gabe Evans, and today we'll be explaining the physics behind the sword. So as you can see, this is a picture of a sword, and these are the equations we're going to use. So as you, as you hold a sword, as your dominant hand is up near the top of the handle, and your weak hand is up the bottom. The top hand will be the fulcrum right here, which will be the center of axis for rotational action. And your back hand will be the one applying the force. So you'll be pushing or pulling with your back hand, which will cause rotational about the fulcrum. And the center mass of this particular sword is right at the fulcrum, so that it doesn't the weight of the object doesn't apply to rotational uh, motion. So the first formula is of course torque net equals force times perpendicular or perpendicular force times radius. So that will be the torque applied by your back hand, and the radius will be the distance from the fulcrum. And of course, the, the torque force is perpendicular to that radius. The torque net equals I alpha, so the inertia of the object will be accelerated when you apply torque to it, which will apply rotational motion to the sword, which will grant it kinetic energy. So 1 half I omega squared is kinetic energy for rotational. Uh, it will be accelerating the object to have an uh, angular velocity, and that will create the kinetic energy. And basically, when you hand an object, you will transfer that kinetic energy mm -hmm. to whatever that object is, at least some of it, while applying the force on the bleeding edge. And the wedge, like an axe, so it's very fine and you're accelerating it fast. So all the force here that's going to be transferred to an object is applied directly to the blade, so basically just fractures and wedges the object apart. And that's what a cut does, even for a small object such as a knife or an axe. Or Hi, I'm Patrick Eckert, and I'm going to explain to you the physics of cabinets. So here you can see we have some diagrams of cabinets. In this, di in this diagram right here, the catapult is at rest, and the spring is also, the spring of the catapult is also at rest, meaning that there is no potential energy in the system. However, as you can see, as the arm of the catapult gets pulled back, the spring right here extends, and potential energy is added to the system. 
So once it's once it's fully extended here in a normal catapult, an outside force holds the arm down. Now at this point, when the outside force is holding the arm down, the system has a kinetic energy of half the spring constant times the displacement of the string, string well, the spring squared. However, once it's released, once the outside force releases the spring, it is, be, it is it's being converted into the inertia times the angular velocity squared, which is the kinetic energy of the system. And say you have an object in here like a rock that's being thrown. At first it has this angular um, kinetic energy right here, but once it's released from the catapult, once, it, once the catapult gets from here to here and the rock is released, it becomes half mv squared, which is linear kinetic energy. So this is how this, this, this is how a catapult turns potential kinetic potential energy into linear kinetic energy.